Welcome back to our diving and health series in which we're talking about decompression sickness. And in this chapter three, we're going to be talking about diagnosing decompression sickness. Keep watching. While decompression sickness is commonly thought of as being a bubble disease, bubbles are probably only the gateway to a complex array of consequences and effects. Decompression sickness may develop when a diver's degree of supersaturation is so high, or stated in another way, if the elimination gradient is so steep, that the controlled transfer of inert gases from body tissues to bloodstream and from there to the lungs is simply inadequate and gases come out of solution to the extent that bubbles are formed that distort tissues and obstruct blood flow or cause mechanical damage for instance to joints or trigger a cascade of biochemical responses. Although much is known about decompression sickness, its mechanisms of insult are still being investigated. So what are the signs and symptoms of decompression sickness? The collective insult to the body's system that can be produced by decompression sickness is actually quite varied. The condition's primary effects may be evident in those tissues that are directly affected, but its secondary effects can also compromise the function of a broad range of tissues, further jeopardizing the diver's health. The ability to recognize the signs or objective evidence and the symptoms or subjective perceptions of decompression sickness and to distinguish these from the signs and symptoms of less likely causes is a very important distinction. There are varieties of classification systems that have been used for decompression sickness. One common approach has been to describe cases as so-called type 1 or type 2. Now type 1 decompression sickness is usually characterized by musculoskeletal pain or mild skin symptoms. Common type 1 skin manifestations may include itching and mild rashes. And we distinguish those from the mottled or marbled discoloration of skin that is sometimes known as cutis marmorata that actually may be a harbinger of more serious forms or type 2 decompression sickness. Less common but still associated with type 1 decompression sickness is the observation of lymphatic swelling that may occur or localized pain in tissues surrounding lymph nodes such as armpits, the groin or even behind the ears. The symptoms of type 1 decompression sickness can build in intensity. For instance, the pain that originates as a mild ache in the vicinity of a joint or muscle may then increase in magnitude. However, the pain associated with decompression sickness typically will not increase upon movement of the affected joint. Although holding a limb in a different position than another may reduce some discomfort. What we mean by this is that if you are able to actively touch, massage or move a joint in such a way that pain increases, it's unlikely to be bubble related and more likely to be another form of musculoskeletal injury. Now common sites of musculoskeletal pain associated with decompression sickness 1 may include the shoulders, elbows, hips, knees and ankles. Let's now consider type 2 decompression sickness. 
type 2 symptoms are considered more serious and they fall into three categories neurological, inner ear and cardiopulmonary. Neurological symptoms may include numbness or paresthesia or an altered sense such as tingling, muscle weakness or impaired gait, difficulty walking, problems with physical coordination or bladder and bowel control, paralysis or change in mental status such as confusion or lack of alertness. Inner ear symptoms may include ringing in the ears known as tinnitus or hearing loss, severe vertigo, nausea and vomiting and impaired balance. Cardiopulmonary symptoms commonly known as the chokes include a dry cough, chest pain behind the sternum or breastbone and breathing difficulty known as dyspnea. These respiratory complaints are typically due to high bubble loads in the lung that compromise the lung's ability to function and may be life-threatening to the diver and treatment should be sought promptly. Type 2 symptoms can develop quickly or slowly. A slow buildup can sometimes obscure the seriousness of the situation because it may encourage denial as it persists over a period of time. For instance, fatigue or weakness, which are common concerns, may gradually increase and it's almost like the story of the frog in the water that is heated gradually. At which point is it bad enough to report? That example may apply to decompression sickness type 2 as well. Less common symptoms such as walking difficulty, difficulty urinating, abnormalities of hearing or seeing vision especially may be quick in onset and may be recognized more quickly. It's fair to say that divers can initially be reluctant to report their symptoms though they usually will do so if the symptoms persist. It is a shortcoming of divers that they should rather err on the side of safety and report symptoms earlier. Earlier recognition of symptoms can often result in earlier intervention and prevent something that is mild from becoming serious. Let's now look at the presentation of decompression sickness. The presentation of decompression sickness is frequently idiosyncratic, that is atypical. It's not necessarily always the same. And the affected diver may have different complaints and some complaints may attract more attention than others. Some may be subtle whereas others that are maybe not as troublesome or as painful may actually be more important. The following list ranks the initial manifestations of decompression sickness from those most commonly seen to those least commonly reported. Pain, particularly near the joints, numbness or paresthesia, constitutional concerns such as headache, lightheadedness or unexplained fatigue, malaise, nausea and vomiting or even anorexia, just being off your food, dizziness or vertigo, motor weakness, cutaneous or skin problems such as an itch, rash or sometimes mottling the cutest marmorata we spoke about, muscle discomfort and impaired mental status. Then follows pulmonary problems such as breathing difficulties, the chokes, impaired coordination, reduced level of consciousness, auditory symptoms such as hearing sounds that are not there or having a hard time hearing, 
lymphatic concerns such as regional swelling, bladder or bowel dysfunction such as retention of urine, and compromised cardiovascular function. According to this recent review, pain and numbness, also known as paresthesia, was reported initially in nearly two-thirds of cases of decompression sickness, whereas constitutional symptoms were reported in 40% of cases. Dizziness, vertigo and motor weakness in approximately 20% of cases and skin symptoms in approximately 10% of cases. So how do we differentiate? What is the differential diagnosis of decompression illness? Well, decompression sickness is a high-profile diving injury because of its potential severity. But divers need to know that not all diving related problems turn out to ultimately be decompression sickness. When two or more conditions have overlapping symptoms, as is the case with many diving related injuries, the differential process may be a little bit difficult and medical personnel will have to figure out which of the potential conditions is likely to be the most serious and to be responsible for the symptoms. Because it is not always known whether it is bubble related or whether the bubbles stem from inert gas bubbles or bubbles being circulated into the arterial system either because of a shut in the heart and lung or because of a lung overpressure injury, the term decompression illness has been used and coined to encompass both decompression sickness and the arterial gas embolism or paradoxical embolism group. This helps clinically to at least manage gas bubble disease in a consistent way. Symptoms may also sometimes be the result of inner ear barotrauma, middle ear or maxillary sinus overinflation, contamination of a breathing gas, oxygen toxicity, musculoskeletal strain or trauma sustained during or after a dive, marine life envenomation, immersion pulmonary edema, water aspiration or coincidental neurological disorders such as stroke. Thermal stress sometimes due to excessive heat but usually due to cold exposure can also be responsible for such symptoms. In some cases a careful history can easily rule out the diagnosis this way or that. For instance, symptoms of immersion pulmonary edema often develop at depth. In such a case, a good history would rule out decompression sickness because the symptoms developed at depth and not during or after ascent. It is essential for divers with any of these symptoms to seek proper medical evaluation and support. While first aid responders are able to perform initial analysis of an individual who's been injured, such as administering a field neurological assessment and starting oxygen first aid, the capabilities of non-physicians do not come close to the clinical skills and insights held by experienced clinical specialists. And with that, we hope that you will have a broader perspective on the differential diagnosis of decompression sickness, type 1 or type 2, or the overarching diagnosis of decompression illness. Please subscribe to this channel, feel free to add your comments, interact with us and share your own experiences or ask questions, maybe if they involve another diver or a dive buddy. Thank you for watching.